uh, to talk a little bit about the rapture. Uh, we've, we've placed the rapture, and hopefully we've done that in a suitable enough way that you understand uh, what it seems to me that the Bible teaches about this subject matter. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of the differences of opinion about this particular subject matter. Um, I don't think all of those differences are necessary because I think that the word is relatively clear about some things. The rapture is going to happen. And I think that even the fact that the rapture is going to happen pre-tribulationally is clear scripturally. And there's really not a whole lot of reason to have doubts about this or to be you know, at odds with one another uh, uh, over this subject matter. If you look at the texts that are there as we have, I think that those things pop out quite clearly is there most definitely is going to be a rapture and that it's going to happen pre-tribulationally. Now, having said that, uh, what, what, what's actually going to happen, uh, we get the bulk of this information really out of the book of, or I should say the epistle, the, the letter of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, and then moving on into chapter 5 a little bit, uh, this subject matter was dealt with by the Apostle Paul with some depth and some detail, and uh, um, for our purposes tonight, most of what we need to, to glean from all of that is found in just a couple of verses, 16 and 17 in chapter 4. Uh, what is going to happen in the rapture? Well, this is what's going to happen. Uh, the Lord Jesus is going to come into the sky. Do we know more than that? We really don't. That's about as deep as the description gets, that the Lord himself is going to descend out of where he's at now back into our, our, our present realm, into uh, our neck of the woods, if you will. And uh, when he does this, uh, he's not coming the whole way back to earth. The... Uh, the uh, description that we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 quite clearly says that, he, that this is occurring in the skies. So when the Lord comes back for us in the rapture, it's not going to be something that is going to end with him at Jerusalem as the king. We said that ultimately, if you recall, right at the very beginning of this whole session that we started doing on eschatology, we said ultimately that's what eschatology is all about is about the Jewish Messiah reigning and ruling in Jerusalem. That's what eschatology is all about. Uh, the rapture is not going to end in that. The rapture is an event that's on the way to that, that's leading up to that, but it's not the same thing as that. And so a lot of times there's confusion that happens about this kind of thing over some of the issues that I was just mentioning in my introductory comments there. Uh, some of those issues occur because folks don't see biblically that there's a difference between Jesus uh, descending into the skies for the rapture and Jesus descending to Jerusalem for his return. And those two things are not the same thing. They're described differently. The detail is differently. It's there if you want to see it. If you go and you look in the Word of God and see those details, things get pretty clear and there's not all that much need for confusion about it. They're, they're different. So, when the Lord comes back for the rapture, it's going to be something that occurs in the sky, not something that occurs here on ground level. Uh, what else is going to be associated with that? We see this. I have so much fun pointing. It keeps me uh, you know, somewhat disciplined in getting things done here, right? Uh, the uh, uh, two, two uh, features of sound are going to be coming along with this or occurring um, uh, contemporaneous with this particular event. One is a loud voice, and uh, believe it or not, in the Thessalonians, it's mentioned both the Lord and the voice of an archangel. So, it, you know, are more than one people coming with a shout of command? Possibly, you know, maybe it's the Lord Jesus, maybe it's the archangel. It, I, don't, I don't think it matters all that much, uh, other than knowing that someone's going to be shouting, not just us on the way up. Right. Uh, the Lord's going to descend into the skies with a loud voice and then also with a trumpet sound. There's going to be a trumpet sound. Uh, is this the same as the last trump that's mentioned, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Uh, is this, has anything to do with the trumpets that we'll be talking about 
when we jump back into that section of the Revelation? Um, no. Uh, this is this is a this is a particular particular signal that has to do with this event. It's not necessarily associated with any other trumpet soundings or whatnot that we find in the in the Bible uh, anywhere else. So uh, it's going to be a loud voice and a trumpet sound. Uh, then the dead in Christ are going to rise. Now you may wonder where the dead in Christ are right now. The dead in Christ right now are with Christ. But they don't have physical bodies. Okay? Uh, what happens when, when believers die is that their bodies are, for the most part, I mean there are some that, that this doesn't happen for, but for the most part when someone dies, their body is interred in the ground or some such like, and it decays. Turns back to the dust that it's made out of. And the soul, the spirit being of that person uh, is separated from that body and that, that spirit being, after the resurrection of Christ, <coughs> goes basically to one of two places. It either goes to the place that we call Hades. Um, hell, that's not the same as the lake of fire, that's not the same as Gehenna. There's, if you, for instance, are reading in Matthew and Jesus talks about the, you know, it'll, the fires of hell will be like Gehenna. Uh, that is really talking about something that's occurring at the final judgment. So the final judgment has to do with the lake of fire. The final judgment has to do with the fires of Gehenna. In the meantime, the, the souls, the spirit beings of those that die that don't go to be with the Lord are put into this place, basically it's the storage place, uh, a place of waiting, if you will, uh, that's called Sheol in the Hebrew or called Hades in the Greek. And it's just a place that God has made for that particular purpose, to hold on to the, you know, the, the, the essence of self that, that a person has uh, separated from their bodies. Um, that place was where everyone went before Christ rose from the dead. When Christ rose from the dead, those who had been faithful, those who had faith in Yahweh, those who had faith in God, the whole way back to Adam, that were there in that place when Jesus rose from the dead, they went into heaven with Jesus. Jesus rose physically from the grave, and when he rose physically from the grave, and he went up, of course all the disciples saw him go up to the, the sky, and they said he'll come back the same way he went up. That's what it talks about in Acts chapter 1. But one of the things that also happened with that event is that when Jesus went into heaven, he had in his train a, a host of captives. He led captivity captives, so all of those, all of those uh, disembodied souls of faithful people who were in this storage place at the time that Jesus rose from the dead, they went with Jesus and were with the Heavenly Father. So they're with God now. All of the people of faith after Jesus rose from the dead, they don't go to that storage place. They go directly to be with the Lord in heaven. So, so when Jesus rose from the dead, something happened as far as what happens to the dead. If you were faithful, you don't have to wait around, you know, like they did for all those years until Jesus uh, rose from the dead. We don't have to do that anymore. The, the dead in Christ now go directly to be with the Lord, but they don't have the bodies. So they're not in the eternal state. They're not in the state that is, you know, the state of perfection that God is ultimately has in mind for us. We're not meant to be disembodied spirit beings. God has created us to have flesh and a spirit being. Those things are meant to be married. That is, that's the, uh, the perfection in, in the sight of God as far as our existence goes. So, uh, all of those who have gone to be with the Lord, all those faithful people who have gone to be with the Lord from throughout all time, I, thankfully they're with the Lord and they're, they're experiencing that and there's a certain joy in that being in the presence of the Lord spiritually. But it's not ultimately what God has for them 
And what he does have for them, he has for all of us who, who trust in him, and that is to have a body and a spirit being united together in a way where sin does not dwell, where death does not have reign or rule, where there is no cause for tear or pain. That's ultimately the aim. So when this rapture occurs, all of those spirit beings that have been with Christ in the heaven since his resurrection, they will, in a, just you know, like that, they will instantly be given uh, bodies, physical bodies. They'll rise right up out of the ground. They don't have to come out of their grave site. You know, people often worry about that. You know, I, I have to take good care of my of my mortal remains because they're going to rise from the dead. And you think about this for a second, right? Um, do you think, honestly, that all the atoms, all the molecules that made up your body, are going to be coming back together and making up your new body? Half the molecules probably you have in your body was in, were in somebody else's body at some point in time. <laughs> I mean, we, under, we understand that, right? So, so, I mean, there's a lot of superstition that goes along with all this stuff. And, and, you know, if I can disabuse you of some of those things tonight, maybe that would be a good thing. But our bodies that we have now, um, they're flawed. And they have inside of them the makings of sin. The, sin. the sin nature is so married to this existence that once it's put off and once it turns to dust, don't look back. Don't give it another thought. Don't give it a second thought. When Christ comes back, he's going to make something new, to you, new for you. So new, in fact, that it's going to be of the stuff that crosses right past the threshold of the new heavens and the new earth. And, and, and it, will, uh, it will already taste the fullness of righteousness and perfect health and healing and all of those wonderful blessings that are going to be ours throughout eternity. So um, this is the first thing that happens. Well, I, the first thing is that, is that the Lord comes into the skies, the sound goes off, and then all of those, all of the dead, all the faithful dead, suddenly physical bodies will be rising up from the earth. Um, Brand new made bodies out of whatever molecules God needs to snatch for the for the purpose, right? Um, they'll be rising up into the heavens to meet Christ in the air. Uh, someplace in the midst of that, the spirit person that they were gets, you know, reacquainted with a physical being that's being raised, and the 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 the, the big thing that's necessary is is the extrication of the sin nature within the, the souls of those persons will have been accomplished in a perfect way. So just like that, you'll have their ultimate eternal renewal occurring as they rise up at the sound of the trumpet at the loud voice and call. Now, that's not the end of the rapture. That's just the first aspect of it. The next aspect of it is then those who are alive and remain, and I'm thinking that's us, right? We all want to be rapture buddies. I'm anticipating that. Right? Um, when this happens and the dead rise, then we too will find ourselves going up. Now what happens to us is that we are changed. Right? Now one of the most important things that I, that I could ever teach you about this, this particular thing is found in the book of 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15, um, especially down uh, past verse number 15, uh, 50. But what we are taught there is just this particular truth. The, the immortal, the imperishable, that thing which is going to be eternal that God does with us, that he makes us into, that thing cannot be inherited by this nature that we have now. So as much as any of us might want to you know, live eternally, as much, uh, as much as any of us might uh, in our own mind think that, that we are reconciled with God and everything's back on track. It's not quite true. There is an impossibility of this, this particular nature that we've been born with. There's an impossibility uh, uh, for it to actually inherit what God has in mind for us for all eternity. So this nature that we have has got to go by the wayside. 
There's basically two ways that happens. One is that we die, and it turns to dust. Our soul spirits, you know, go to be with the Lord, and then, you know, we do what I just was talking about if, we, if we've been dead. But if we're alive and remain, we basically have to pull off the same thing that happened to them, only in a flash. Right? It's not that we're dying, but we are accomplishing what the dead accomplished in their death in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed, and this old Adamic nature, I mean, you know, it's not that I'm going to lose all of my molecules and then they're going to have to be reconstituted. In a flash, I'll have new molecules. I'll have a new physical being in a flash. In a, in a flash, everything that, that is so difficult right now in terms of this battle that we have between the spirit and the flesh within, in a flash, that's all going to be rectified. So in a twinkling of an eye is the way the Bible describes it. I, I think a flash is a good way of thinking about that. In a flash, we will be changed into our eternal state. And we will be going up into the air to meet with those who were dead and have risen before us. And Christ, who's come down to meet us in the air. That is, uh, that's, the, that's the rapture. Now it says the rapture, uh, the, the rapture in the, the, these uh, uh, Thessalonian uh, 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 phrases and, and sentences about the subject matter, they all say the same thing. It's, it's all about what goes on in the air. That's an important thing to, to, to recognize and realize. Uh, again, why do so many uh, Christians have so much trouble with this subject matter? It's, they just miss the details, I think, in some of the places where these things are talked about. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and then moving into chapter 5, it's very important to, to see this particular detail that this has nothing at all to do with, with the earth. This is all about happening in the skies. We get raptured up into the skies to be with the Lord. And what does it say? It says, thereafter we'll, we'll ever be with Him. Now the important thing about that is that that's exactly the description that you find in Revelation chapter 7. You know, where it's talking about the uh, innumerable hosts of saints that have come out of the Great Tribulation, all those Gentile saints. And what, is it, what does it describe at the, the very back half of that description as you're finishing up chapter 7? It describes them as being in the presence of the Lord. It describes them as being before the throne of God. It describes them as being in the place where there's no tear in the eye and there's nothing to cause pain. In other words... You have a description there in Revelation chapter 7 that says very clearly where, where these raptured saints end up going. They don't, they don't come back down to the earth. You know, if you, if you believe in, for instance, a post-tribulation rapture, you have to believe that this, this is what happens. The trump sounds, we all go shooting up into the sky, and no sooner than we get there, then we all come back down and take over planet earth. But that is not at all what the burden of 1 Thessalonians says it all. There, it's, there it leaves it with us meeting Christ in the sky and there ever after being with him. Right? Why is that detail important? Well, because it's just another thing that goes into all of these details that we're starting to line up. Have you noticed how they all start lining up when you, when you look at them uh, on face value? Uh, the picture starts getting clear and the things start validating and verifying each other, and the, all the reasons that sometimes we've had for being confused or misunderstanding about all these things kind of evaporate and disappear. Um, this is another one of those things. People that don't appreciate the rapture, they think it's a Pollyanna thing, they think it's escapism, they think it's for people who don't really want to do the tough work of serving the Lord in difficult search, uh, circumstances. Um, and they think, you know, with all of those things, it's not, uh, it's not a valid thought. No, it is a valid thought. You have to read the details that are given in the accounts. And when you do, you see that, that the raptured are not at all anywhere in the places that talk about them being raptured um, communicated or described as if they are back at earth. They're not back at earth. They're with the Lord. So when we go up, we... <laughs> We meet him in the air. He's in the skies. He's in the skies, right? That's as far as he comes. And we go up, and we meet him in the air. We meet him in the air, and then we're with him. 
where are we with him? We're with him in his throne room. We're with him in, in that place where, uh, where um, God is present without, uh, maybe we could say without a curtain, you know, if you like the Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> where God is present uh, with nothing to stand in between. Um, the, uh, the rapture represent, we talked about this, so I don't have to say much about that. They represent the full number of Gentiles coming in. Again, that's an important concept. Why? Because that, that whole concept of full number, it speaks to the, fina the, the finality of an aim, the finality of, a, of, a, of an error. What was the error? The, well, the error was a hardening on the Jews and a opportunity, a gracious opportunity for the Gentiles to hear the gospel and come in. When the full number of the Gentiles has come in, full number, right? That nice, that nice expression, that nice uh, 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 phrase, if you will, that speaks to an end, says that that error is over. Now something else is going to happen. What could that be? Well, I think Paul describes it in, in verse number 26. Then all Israel will be saved. So uh, what's going to happen at the rapture, that's basically where the 70th week begins. Remember we had the 69th week and the Messiah was cut off. He was left with nothing as Daniel says. So the Messiah was cut off at the end of the 69th week Then we went into that gap. What was that gap? That gap was this era when a partial hardening is on the Jews and the gospel is yielded, given, proclaimed amongst the Gentiles. When the full number of the Gentiles has come in, then that gap is over. The whole purpose of that gap has been accomplished fully and completely. Full number. I can't, I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough how that little phrase, full number, is meant to be seen as an exclamation mark. You know, it's, it's meant to really uh, clarify that something is changing in a drastic way uh, a thing that was has, is ceasing to be it is no longer. Okay, so we go into the 70th week. So what the rapture ends up being is it ends up being the opening event for the 70th week. It ends up being the signal event that says that the 70th week has begun. God is turning His attention back to the Jews with this aim in mind. All Israel will be saved. God is going for the whole uh, kibbutz, the whole uh, kit and caboodle with the Jewish people. No, 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 no. <laughs> the whole kit and caboodle with the Jewish people during that time. And that's what his aim is. Um, I'm glad I'm not here for that. As we go through the descriptions that we come across for that period of time, there's nothing pleasant about it. There's nothing pleasant about it even if you're Jewish. <laughs> But if you're not Jewish, definitely so. There's nothing pleasant about that 70, that 70th week. Uh, it is a, it's a period of time of wrath. Uh, the wrath of God gets poured out. We, when we were looking at that sixth seal in chapter six of the Revelation, what was the, what was the expression that told us where to place that? You know, in the understanding of how things are going to unfold. Well, it was the proclamation that's coming from the people experiencing. What are they saying? You know, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, for his wrath has come. Uh, and so, what what we are, what you see at the end of the sixth seal, or I should say, the, what you see in the sixth seal, is that again this period of time in this gap is closing, and the seventieth week is is going. So, if you think about those two things going side by side. The sixth seal represents the ending of the gap. The rapture represents the ending of the gap. Does that mean that the rapture and the sixth seal are one and the same thing? And I think for the most part they probably are. If you go to Revelation chapter 7 and you start reading that chapter, it starts off with the, the 144,000, what's going on with them. And one of the things that happens there, interestingly enough, 
is that angels are holding back the wind, holding back the judgment of God on, on earth, so that nothing can be harmed until the 144,000 are sealed. I, I find it interesting that that comes right, at, right after you get done with the, the description of the sixth seal, which is a humongous earthquake, the sky rolling back like a scroll, all kinds of things falling, you know, uh, hail and, and whatnot falling from the skies, um, the, the mountains and, and, and the islands being moved. I mean, you get this, this incredible description of quite a cataclysm going on. And right at the point in time when it's talking about all those nasty stuff, what does it say? It says that angels are holding back the judgment uh, so that the 144,000 can be sealed. You know, what that, you know, what that conjures up in my mind is the thought that they're simultaneous. The sixth seal and, and Revelation chapter 7 are simultaneously. They're, they're, they're occurring at the same time. And what happens is when that sixth seal breaks open and that cataclysm is, is released, two things are going on right in the midst of that. Number one, the 144,000 are being sealed. And number two, the Gentile saints switch locations. They were on the earth. That's not stated directly like it will be for the 144,000 a little bit later in the, in the Revelation. But the 144, or the uh, Gentile saints switch locations. No longer are they spoken of in terms of earthly descriptions. Now they are described in terms of heavenly descriptions, heavenly locations. So what does that mean? How did they, how did they make that jump? How did they make the switch in locations? How did they get from the earth? It's, it's the rapture. And so what I think, you know, about this, this rapture is basically this, is that this is going to occur in the midst of the sixth seal breaking. The sixth seal is that volcanic cataclysm, as I described it. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. Um, I don't know of anything else that, that would actually accomplish that description that's there. Um, everything that's in that description would fit well with a super volcanic eruption, a mega volcanic eruption, and so that's why it seems to me that that's, that's what that is talking about. And in the midst of that, as that is occurring, God snatches up his, his, his uh, church from off the earth and seals 144,000. Which, if you think about it, right, one of the things that people ask, well, if you have this rapture that occurs, this you know, secret rapture that occurs, People are going to notice all those people disappearing, and, and they're going to ask questions about it. And that's going to cause a big stir, and you know that's that's not going to work out. And what's that going to do? That's going to make everything just you know, and no one's going to be able to live life normally after that. Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, we'll get to the delusion that in, in a little bit, not tonight, but we will. Um, but the thing about that is, is, is that this is occurring in the midst. Of something like Yellowstone or Long Valley or Vallis going off. Those are three super volcanoes in America, incidentally. All of them are considered active. Um, some of them are considered more dangerous than others. Believe it or not, Yellowstone is considered to, to be moderately dangerous. Long Valley is considered to be very dangerous. Uh, Vallis is considered to be somewhat dangerous. Because uh, they have all gone off, you know, supposedly in the last, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand years uh, for Long Valley and, and the Vallis and the Yellowstone went off about 620,000 years ago, supposedly. Um, but if these things go off and they're all still active, we're talking, we're talking the likes of which things, we, you know, we have not ever seen in, in human history. I mean, we just, we just don't have records of events that have occurred at that level. Uh, so for instance, if Yellowstone goes off, you're going to have up to two feet of ash at the Mississippi. I mean, we're talking about the corner of Wyoming. Two feet of ash. Now that, that means the bread basket of America is going to be under anywhere from two to six feet of ash. What is that going to do to your wheat, your corn, and your sunflower, and you know, all the other things? It's going to wipe it out. What about all the cattle up in Nebraska? Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it just, things aren't going to go well. Uh, so, I mean, it, you know, that is the kind of thing, uh, depending on where the fallout goes, it seems like probably from the way the, the, uh, 
uh, the uh, prevailing winds blow, it's probably going to hit northern Europe uh, and up into Russia pretty badly as well, as far as just things like deprivation of sunlight, uh, winters that are um, much colder, um, summers that are much colder, that kind of thing. So, um, would that kind of event provide cover for the devil and his minions, and particularly the Antichrist, uh, to explain away the loss of the believing population from the earth? Probably so. I mean, with that kind of chaos and that kind of upheaval, um, are people going to start thinking in terms of, oh no, the rapture that they always talked about has occurred, and you know, that probably not. Yes. You know, is it hard to imagine after what we've seen, just you know, the, the somewhat less significant uh, things that have been going on the last couple of years? It, it would it be easy to understand the rapture getting lost in the midst of something like Yellowstone going off or Long Valley going off or Vallis going off, I, I would say, yeah, it would provide really good cover uh, for that. I, I think that the rapture would get lost uh, easily in the midst of those kinds of, uh, uh, you know, that kind of event going off. So uh, that's the rapture. Uh, and then this last point here is, you know, the one that we've looked at before too. Just, just want to reiterate it tonight. Um, once the church is gone, Right? Once the church is gone, that means the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Once the church is gone, that means the full number of Gentiles has come in. So what does that mean about any more Gentiles after that? There's no biblical reason to believe not even one Gentile would be saved during the tribulation. I never put it past God to do something merciful. Right? He always surprises us, just like he surprised Jonah yeah, well, I guess Jonah wasn't all that surprised, but I mean, uh, at, at Nineveh. Um, is it possible for God to do some gracious work that, that's not written about in the Word during that time here and there? Well, sure it is. God gets to do what He wants because He's God. But what He's revealed in the Word is that we should not expect. Today is the day of salvation. And today is the day that people need to hear the Gospel and respond to the Gospel. Because the 70th week has one purpose and one purpose only. For God to save all Israel. It's the only reason it's there. The work that he promised Daniel that he would do with his people and his holy city. So the 70th week is about an opportunity for the Jews in Jerusalem to get it right. right? To come to, to their Messiah. That's what it's about. Let's go on. I wanted to take care of that and get to this. Uh, the 70th week overview. Oh, I've talked way too much on the rapture already, so this will be interesting. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can open it to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. And uh, we're going to we're going to go through this. And my approach in sharing with this with you tonight is just this. If you want to understand that 70th week in an overarching kind of a way, the place that you can look for a symbolic presentation of that in the Bible is found in Revelation 12 and 13. Revelation 12 and 13. Revelation 13. Those two chapters give a symbolic overview of basically what that 70th week is all about. Now, I'm not going to read all of this. I was going to read all of this, but for the uh, sake of time tonight, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to have you open your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 12, and uh, we'll go through these in order, because these, these are in the order that they're found in the, in the text. Um, what do you need to understand the 70th week? Well, go to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is that in symbols. What are those symbols? This is important. If you understand this and you see this, everything the Bible says about end time will make sense to you. Every path, this is, this is what did it for me. 
when, when Revelation chapter 12, when I was very frustrated and driving myself nuts because I couldn't find clarity in the scripture, when something dropped out of the sky, so to speak, into my heart on Revelation chapter 12, it suddenly put everything into place. From that moment on, I have gone on just a continual, uh, a continual movement toward greater and greater clarity and understanding on end times things. Um, uh, I dare say that at this point in time, and I don't think this, this is not braggadocious at all, but, I, but at this point in time, what I've found since then is I have yet to find a passage of Scripture that doesn't make sense by this interpretation of Revel Revelation chapter 12. Okay, So what do these symbols mean? Uh, the woman that this starts talking out about, now her description is very Jewish. It refers back, as you see here, to uh, Genesis chapter 37, verse number 9. Uh, that's where, of course, we have the dream of Joseph that got him into so much trouble with his brothers, even with his mom and dad. Um, that particular dream and this particular sequence, they share the same basic structure in, in symbols. That's why you know that they're talking, in some respects, one's meant to give you information about the other. Uh, what is the information that that dream back in Genesis is meant to give us about this particular revelation in chapter 12? It's meant to give us the identification of the woman, that the woman is Israel. Now, she's not Israel in the sense of just the nation of Israel, but she's Israel in the sense of Israel that's right, Israel that's believing, Israel that is, was waiting for their Messiah, if you will, Israel that uh, trusted the Word of God, that, that, that Israel, you know, a true Israel, spiritual Israel. Uh, that doesn't make it the church, it just makes it those who were truly believing. Uh, I would say that all the disciples are painted by this description, right? I would say that, you know, the Simon, <laughs> uh, Simon, Simeon, the old man waiting for the Messiah, uh, all of that kind of thing fits this description. We go back in time of Israel, of uh, people that believe like David and on and on and on. That description, right? The woman is Israel. Her pregnancy is not Jesus. This is where this is where insight definitely opens up and where understanding comes in. Because <laughs> as long as as long as you are looking at this particular passage of scripture that this pregnancy is about Jesus, you will fail to understand eschatology. It's not until you understand that her pregnancy is not about Jesus, it's about the church. We are the body of Christ, right? We are the body of Christ, the church. So once you understand this particular little nugget here, the pregnancy is not Jesus, the pregnancy is the church. Everything, everything falls into place and clicks, okay? Uh, this woman, Israel, believing Israel, spiritual Israel, is pregnant. What is she pregnant from? She is pregnant from the church. Now, this goes to what Paul talks about in, Rebel, uh, in Romans, in, in Romans uh, chapter 9 and 10 and 11, uh, in those three places. Now, a lot of times we think that's all about election. You do if you're a Calvinist. Thankfully, I'm not a Calvinist, so, you know, I understand that that's not what it's all about. That passage of Scripture is really uh, about Israel and why Israel doesn't believe. I mean, that's, that's exactly what Paul starts talking at, uh, about at the beginning of of uh, chapter 9, and he's basically working his way through an explanation of, you know, why that's the case the whole way down to the end of chapter 11. Um, what, what he is basically saying, of course, is that, that the church, or along the line he says this, the church is something that isn't a separated entity. We have roots. We are a wild kind of a thing that's been grafted into this heritage, this spiritual heritage, this spiritual root of Israel. And so the Gentile church is not a separate thing. It's not a thing that replaces Israel. Remember I was talking about supersessionism and why that was so wrong? The church is not a replacement of Israel. The church is not a substitute for Israel. The church is not the new Israel. The church is a pregnancy of Israel. The church arose out of Israel. 
And she was, she's, she is our source. Our scriptures are the Jewish scriptures. Our Messiah is the Jewish Messiah. Our understanding of morality and society and between people and in marriages and families, all of that, it all goes back to those Jewish roots, right? We are plugged in to the Jewish root. That's our tap, if you will. That's where our life came from. That's where everything has come from. And that pregnancy in this, this chapter is not Jesus, it's the church. Now, this goes to this full number, remember I keep, I keep on going back to the full number of Gentiles, right? What happens when a pregnancy has achieved its full gestation? When you reach the full number of days, you're born, right? When the full number of Gentiles has come in, if you want to take it into this particular visionary way of looking at it, what's going to happen? Something's going to be born. That's exactly what happens in this vision. Right? We see that, we see that uh, the devil, the dragon, he is uh, sitting there waiting for this baby to be born. He wants to destroy it. He wants to chomp it down. And the minute the baby is born, somehow or another, the devil misses out on this, right? Six seal will do that. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, ch the child, the male child, is snatched away into heaven. What does that sound like? <laughs> Sounds like the rapture, doesn't it? The male child is snatched away into heaven. You say, male child? Remember, again, when we were talking about the seal. See, it all comes back, right? All this stuff is <clears throat> together in some way or another. Remember seal number one. It was the white rider. Remember what I said about that. I said, in the Revelation, white never symbolizes anything but purity and godliness. That white rider is not the Antichrist, as you know, someone like Dr. Jeremiah and those who are dispensational along Baptistic lines would say. It's just, just bad, just bad interpretation. That white rider is none other than the church sent by Christ to take the gospel to the world. He said, nothing, we have all authority, nothing is going to overcome us. We are going to succeed in the mission that he's given us. That's the white rider, that's the first seal, right? The church going out to do its evangelistic mission. This, uh, this male child is that rider. See? Male rider on that horse, Ma male child coming out of the pregnant woman. Now the, uh, the stars are falling, are demons, the, the male child is the church as we see. The woman in the wilderness is the 144,000. What happens to the woman after she gives birth? She's still on the earth. Right? So the woman this, this believing community of Israel ends up being in, in the time that she is giving birth, now symbolizing the 144,000. Right? God's not done with the Jews. She's Jewish in her roots and her description. What's going to happen? She goes into the, she goes into the desert uh, for a period that's three and a half years. She's taken care of. Now, the devil... Goes after to uh, goes after her to try to destroy her. Um, what's going on there? Well, the hurling down of the devil to the earth—that's really what uh, what the great tribulation is all about. The devil is cast down to the earth, and he runs amok on the the world, basically doing virtually whatever he wants to. The only thing that God's really protected of, of during that time is the 144,000 in the Jews, and so. You know, everybody else on earth is going to be in just a, a terrible shape because, you know, the, the devil's going to be running loose and ruling. Um, maybe that's, the, you know, maybe that's the woke, woke culture. I don't know. But uh, uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the great tribulation. The two wings of the eagle that are taking that woman to, you know, the 144,000, to that place of security... That, that, I think, is symbolic of the two witnesses. So in chapter 11, we talked about those two witnesses. Now I can identify, I told you one's Elijah, the other is Enoch. Why do I know that when so many people identify him as Moses? Moses is a bad interpretation because Moses has already died. 
The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then to face judgment, right? There's no way in the world Moses died almost 5,000 years ago. It's going to come back to earth in a living body and be killed again to rise again. That's just, that just doesn't make sense of anything that's in the scripture. There is a figure that we know needs to die, right? His name is Enoch. Enoch walked with God and was not because he pleased the Lord. What did I say about inheriting our, our imperishable state? We can't do it in this body, which means what for Enoch? It means Enoch is hanging around up in heaven in this endemic body that needs to be done away with because he can't inherit eternal blessings in that condition. So what's going to happen with Enoch? He's going to come and get a chance to get rid of this mortal coil. Same thing with Elijah. Elijah was taken up into heaven, never died. He's in heaven in a physical body that cannot inherit the imperishable. So what has to happen to Elijah? Guy needs to die. Sounds like a, sounds like a Clint Eastwood movie. Those guys need to die. <laughs> Uh, Enoch and Elijah, unfortunately, they both need to die. Why? Because they cannot inherit the imperishable until they put off the perishable. So you have to put off the perishable to be able to inherit the imperishable. So Enoch and Elijah need to say goodbye to their endemic flesh. That's going to happen. They're the two witnesses. Look, Revelation chapter 11 describes exactly how that happens. And so, uh, the, two, the two wings, I believe, are symbolic of those two witnesses. They come onto the field just at the right time to help the 144,000. And I think that's, that's a pretty good picture of what you have in Revelation chapter 11. And then the rest of the offspring that talks about there at the end of chapter 12, what is that? That's all the Jews that are coming to faith in Christ through the testimony of the two witnesses in the 144,000. Does that help? <laughs> uh, if, if you can understand Revelation chapter 12, if you can understand all these, these pieces of vision, according to it, uh, this kind of interpretation, it, it makes sense within itself. And not only does it make sense within itself, but it helps you to understand the Olivet Discourse. It helps you to understand Daniel. It really just kind of brings all the pieces together. Uh, probably more so than anything else in the scripture, this singular chapter in the Bible uh, will do more to clarify what is going on in the very last times than, than anything does.